worship the Lord this morning. Father, we want to begin today by saying thank you. Now, while it is a service of thanksgiving every week, today we are beginning this transition of the Thanksgiving week, Lord, as we prepare uh, for Thanksgiving on Thursday. But Lord, I pray that this season will be one that is truly blessed. And Father, today may we begin afresh to turn our hearts and our eyes upon as we have gathered here to worship, Lord, may we give you not only our praises, Lord, but our thanks as well. For even in the midst of this global pandemic, you have brought your church together. You have poured out your spirit, and you have given blessing upon blessing upon blessing. We have seen your hand at work. And today, Lord, we come to proclaim the goodness that is you. And so now, Lord, I pray that you will fill this place with your Shekinah glory, that you will move in a mighty way amongst our hearts, Lord, and draw us closer together and closer to you as well. As we pray in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Oh, God. 
come into a time of prayer this morning. Of course, want to remind you, as we have already, to be thankful and to not only tell God what you need, but to remember to thank Him for what you have. Thank Him for the blessings and the opportunities you have been presented. It's been a difficult year, for sure. But we have seen God move in some mighty and marvelous ways. <coughs> Give God thanks. I will ask that you continue to pray for uh, JJ and Sam. I know Sam, uh, last I heard, is still quarantined at the base. They've sent several girls back home with COVID. She's still okay. I uh, haven't begun her training yet. And JJ has been in uh, Missouri, I think, uh, waiting to begin the next phase of his training at the end of the month. And he's been there for about a month nothing to do. So uh, pray for him that nobody's going stir crazy. So please continue to pray for our churches here in the valley and around the world. Continue to pray for our missionaries. Pray for our nation and those that we have elected to lead. So as always, as we sing, I invite you to come the altar you <laughs> no surprise, Lord, to you what we are facing as a people, as a nation, as a church, Lord. You know everything intimately, and nothing is hidden from your sight. Not our greatest victories or our darkest secrets, Lord, you know them all. You know our struggles. 
We know our failures. We know our refusals. Lord, I pray that you will come and move in our hearts today. That the power of your name would truly reign supreme in our lives. That we would set aside our own desires and ambitions, Lord, and we would take up our cross and follow you. That we would die to ourselves daily. Lord, we would become more like you. Mold us and make us, Lord, I pray, into the men and women you would have us to be. This morning, Lord, you know the requests that have been shared. You know those that are still upon our hearts. You know the ones that are burdens to us, Lord, that we need to lay down. You know the prayers that have been prayed for years and years. Lord, I pray in all these situations that your will would be done. From the pandemic, Lord, to the place we pass this week. Father, may we seek your face and your love in all of these things. May we seek to be good examples of Christian love. And Lord, may we not be so afraid to die that we forget to live for you this week. Your grace has not taken a break for the pandemic. Neither has your command to go into all the world and make disciples. And so, Lord, here in our community, help us to do just that. Make disciples. Lord, may we be relentless in our pursuit of the unsaved. Lord, I thank you for this awesome privilege and responsibility. I thank you for not calling us to do it alone. But you have surrounded us here with our brothers and sisters. And you dwell within us. We thank you, Father God, for inviting us to be a part of your family. So, Lord, again, we give you our thanks and our praise. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Just a reminder, again, on the tithing, if you haven't, you can place your tithes in the box in the back today. You can give online through Tithling, uh, which we've set up a church account for. You can find the information on that on the church website and on the Facebook page. Uh, so before you leave, if that's what you'd like to do, you can do that there. You can set it up online. It takes a couple seconds. So let's stand. Since today is Thanksgiving week, let's sing one good old-fashioned Thanksgiving song. We're going to sing it now. Thank we all our God. It's number 556 if you'd like to follow along in your hymn book.
tried to do something that was hard. And I think we all have, uh, especially when you were trying to learn how to walk, although you probably don't remember that. It's not easy to defy gravity. You ever thought about walking? I mean, what, what that looks like? I mean, walking is literally the art of throwing yourself forward and hoping your other foot catches you before you fall on your face. That's what walking is. It's, it's a controlled dance between you and gravity to propel yourself forward. But it is hard. It's not something that comes easily. Learning how to get your driver's license is difficult. It's not something that comes easily. Taking tests, taking exams. For you ladies, I understand having children is pretty hard. It's kind of like when a man has a cold. I tell you, it's got to be rough. It's got to be rough. <laughs> but there is a struggle to do what is hard. Because often, the struggle to do something is because it's the right thing to do. Often, the easy way not the right way. At least that's been my experience. The hard things in life are the ones that really stretch us and pull us, but more often than not, the right thing to do. So let's look today at Romans chapter 7. Paul's going to transition here, and he's going to be very open ways, I think. And so we're going to take a look in. We're going to look at the whole chapter, Romans chapter 7. Now, we've just come through this section. We're talking about slaves to righteousness instead of slaves to sin. We've talked about the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we're going to pick up here in chapter 7, verse 1. Do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to men who know the law, that the law has authority over a man only as long as he lives? For example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. So then, if she marries another man while her husband is still alive, she is called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is released from that law and is not an adulteress, even though she marries another man. So, my brothers, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit to God. For when we were controlled by the sinful nature, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our bodies, so that we bore fruit for death. But now, by dying to what once was bound to us, we have been released from the law, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit, and not in the old way of the written code. We're going to stop there for just a moment. So he gives us this example of what it means when we die to sin. Now, I think we all understand the concept of adultery. If I run off and marry another woman while I'm still married to Sarah, there's not many cultures in where that's okay. Right? That's adultery. If I'm having a love affair with someone who is not my spouse, I'm breaking that covenant. Now, just as Jesus uses marriage and that covenant that we make is our bond with God when we get saved, Paul is using the abandonment of that covenant to illustrate our bond to sin when we enter into that covenant. You see, when we Turn from righteousness. When we reject God, as we've already said, we enslave ourselves to sin. This is why God says, I'm a jealous God. Right? We are bound to Him through a covenant. Now, a covenant is, is one of the highest forms, and it is the highest form, I should say, that we as human beings can make. Traditionally, in the Old Testament, when a covenant was made, an animal was sacrificed. And what that was saying is, May the same be done to me if I break this covenant. Right? Blood was shed. This is very, very important. And this is why we take our marriage vows so strongly.
Because if I just arbitrarily wander off and find my way around uh, one woman or ten women or however many I feel like, that doesn't mean that I have ever respected or loved my wife. In the same way, we cannot be engaged in illicit activity with the world and still expect to have this intimate relationship with God. Right? That's the law. The law says I can't have it both ways. It's got to be one or the other. But now, if I were to die, my vows and Sarah's vows would be fulfilled, right? Till death do us part. So if I'm dead, she is no longer bound by that vow, and she is not under condemnation by that same law. So when we die with Christ, we are free from the punishment that the law brings. Right? Because the law doesn't apply to dead people or politicians, right? When I die, it doesn't matter what the speed limit is, right? They can, they can ride 100 miles an hour with that casket in the back all the way to the gravesite. Can't give me a ticket, right? Because I'm dead. The law doesn't apply to me anymore. Because we died with Christ, we are free from the punishment and the condemnation that comes with the law. And so now, instead, we can be bound to Christ. We can be bound to God and have that freedom. So long as we're alive, the law reigns supreme. But now that we have died through him, are free in Christ. <clears throat> so instead of bearing fruit for death, we now bear fruit for God. And so we serve the new way of the Spirit, not the old way of the written code. So he goes on, he says, what shall we say then, in verse 7? Is the law sin? Certainly not. Indeed, I would not have known what sin was except through the law. For what I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, do not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of covetous desire. For apart from the law, sin is dead. Once I was alive, <clears throat> apart from the law. But when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me, and through the commandment put me to death. So then the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. Did that which is good then become death to me? By no means. But in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it produced death in me. Through what was good, so that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. I'm going to pause right there, too. Because Paul here, he's, he's, he's trying to explain something to people. In a way, it's kind of like trying to explain color to a person born blind. Because without the law, I wouldn't know what sin was, right? You ever gotten a friendly visit from a police officer who pulled you over and said you were going too fast and you're like, well, I didn't even see a speed limit sign, right? Been driving for miles, haven't seen a single sign. Well, well you were going too fast, here's your ticket. That's, right? I didn't know that I was doing wrong because there was nothing to tell me that I was doing something wrong. It's not that I intended to do that, but now that I know, I'm responsible for that. We see our children, our babies, in the class, and they cry, and they hit, and they scream, and they fight with one another. Because it's what kids do, right? Until they are taught what is right and wrong. And then they're responsible to make the good decisions. 
what Paul is saying here is, well, it's because of the law that I recognized my sin, I became sinful. So that is the law bad? No. But then, when I was told I, I couldn't or shouldn't do something, that thing became the forbidden fruit. You guys ever had the forbidden fruit in your lives? No, no, no cookies until after supper. Hmm. Oh, no, no, no. Whatever you do, don't go over there. Right? Mom ever say, hey, don't look in the closet around right Christmas time. What was the one thing you wanted to do more than anything else in the world, right? You wanted to look in the closet. You knew it was the wrong thing to do. But man, you wanted to look in that closet. Why? Because you wanted to see what was on the other side. That's exactly what Paul was talking about. Sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of covetous desire. He's just giving one example here. Kind of like in Romans 1, he talked about homosexuality. That was one example of sinful behavior. Here, Paul is saying, well, maybe for me it's covetousness, right? I want what other people have. It didn't really bother me before, but then when I was told I shouldn't do that, man, sin just jumped on board and said, hey, hey look at that shiny new bass boat. Ooh, look, they got a new car. Hey, look, they're going on vacation. Hey, wow, did you see those pictures they put up over there? Suddenly, I wanted what I knew was wrong. And so it doesn't make the law bad, but it means that sin has perverted that law. And through God's perfect law, sin has worked in us to make it dead. What was intended to draw us closer to him Sin use to draw us farther away. It took something good and perfect, and it deceived us. And so that commandment that was meant to help us condemned us and put us to death. But we see that he says here in verse 13. Did that which is good then become death to me? By no means. But in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it produced death in me through what was good, so that the commandment sin might be become utterly sinful. Let's call it what it is. Now that I know what sin is, let's recognize it as that. Parents, we have a unique challenge. It's a good example of this. Your kid comes in, and they've got brown stuff on their hands and on their shirt. Now, as a parent, we know that could be any number of things, right? Anything from who they found out in the yard to dirt they were playing in, or maybe they found some hidden candy they had stashed away. What is it? How do you determine what that is? You just lick it? That's not chocolate, right? You smell it? No. You ask questions, right? But once you discern what that is, then you know how to move forward. If it's poo, you don't want to tell your kid, oh, that's chocolate, you're fine, right? Let's call it what it is. Let's recognize what it is so that we can take care of it. When we see sin, we know that sin is sin. It's not like, oh, wow, I had no idea that was sinful. Hmm. Now, there are some things that are a gray area for you as an individual that might be wrong for someone else. But by and large, we kind of have an idea of the big things in our life that for us are sinful. And let's call it what it is. Let's not blame God. Well, the law says this. No, you, we've already covered this. You're dead to the law, right? You're alive in Christ. But now through the law, you can recognize it for what it is. And you can take care of the problem. Another example of this. Think back to high school, middle school. 
right? Algebra. I started adding letters with the numbers. When someone would write something on the board for x plus x, y, whatever, blah, 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 blah. You were in first grade as it solved that. No idea what that is. But once you learn what you were looking at and how to solve it, it became easier. Now, it wasn't always easy, but it became easier to identify the problem and to move forward. And this next section here is, is where Paul, I think, is, is going to be very transparent. So let's, let's look at this in verse 14. I call this the, the doo-doo passage of Scripture here. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual. Sold as a slave to sin. I do not do what I want to do. For, or sorry, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law was good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but sin living in me. I know that nothing good lives in me, that it is my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who does it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in the sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. There's a lot of doo-doos in there. What in the world was Paul talking about? This is a theological argument that it has waged since he wrote it. Was he writing this from the perspective of someone who's not saved? And this is what that's like? Because then in verse 8, he talked, or chapter 8, he talks about this no condemnation for those in Christ. Where, where is Paul writing about this as, as Paul? And, and the answer is, I, I'm not really sure. I don't know. My first impression as I read this is Paul is kind of stepping down off the platform for a minute. And he's coming down to their level saying, look, I know that you see me as Paul the Apostle, but I'm also Paul the guy. Right? I'm Paul the man. I put my toga on one leg at a time just like everybody else. I struggle just as you struggle. I fail sometimes. Just like you fail sometimes. Because there are things that I, I know I should do, but I don't do them because I do other things that I don't want to do. Things I know I ought to hate, but still those things rise up. And, and I do those things instead of the good things I know I should be doing. Now, what does that look like for Paul? I don't know. I'm not Paul. My first guess would have to be maybe this pharisaical attitude. Remember, Paul was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He followed the law with a righteous passion and persecuted the church. And I'm sure from time to time, that desire to see things done just according to the law is still rear its ugly head in Paul's life. There are things that Paul struggled with. Just as there are things that you struggle with. And when you know what you should do, but you struggle with doing something else, you're in good company. And sometimes you do what you know you shouldn't, because you know what you should. This is, I think, what the Bible calls working on our salvation with fear and trembling. This is that process that we go through with God, where we learn more about Him. And in some ways, we still want to wrestle with God. And so Paul says, who will rescue me? 
from this body of death. He says, what a wretched man I am. I can tell you, there are times when I have to just say, Lord, what am I doing? <laughs> Fix my stupid head. Shut my mouth, Lord. Right? There, there are a lot of days when it's a type and delete kind of day, right? The human Josh and then God. No, 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 no. Delete. I think Paul is showing his humanity here. He says, yes, we strive for holiness. We strive for what John Wesley called Christian perfection. He says, not that I have attained all that already, but that's the goal that we set for ourselves. I think the reason Paul wrote it this way is, is we get this idea of the conflict that wages between the sinful nature that wants to come back and our new life in Christ. Because even once we're saved, it doesn't mean that we're above the ability to sin. But our desire in our heart has changed. And we desire the godly things instead of the worldly things. And so he says here, who will rescue me from this body of death? The imagery he paints here is, is of a corpse tied to the body, right? The Romans didn't like this as much as crucifixion, but it was still another form of execution, right? They would take a dead body, a cadaver, and they would strap it to a human who was still alive. This is what Paul was talking about. Who will rescue me from this body of death, right? I don't want to drag around the old sinful way of living because it's dead to me. And yet somehow, it keeps rearing its ugly head. And I still have to struggle. I still have to deal with it. Because I am still human. Now there will come a day when I will be free. body of death continues to follow me around. Now, if we are not freed from that body of death, if we continue to linger and dwell in the sinful nature, as that other body begins to break down and rot, and putrefaction happens, and the fluids and everything else, and the flies and the maggots and all other kinds of disgusting things begin to affect the healthy person, it kills them too. It's not a beautiful picture that Paul paints here. He's not trying to paint a pretty picture. Who can rescue me from that body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. God can rescue me. This is where this is why Jesus didn't say, take up your cross once and then hang it on your wall. Or go pick up one at Hobby Lobby. They got a lot of different options, right? Find one that fits your lifestyle and then put that up or put it around your neck. No, no. Take up your cross. Daily. You must die to yourself daily. Because the struggle is real. It's not imaginary. You shouldn't be looking at other Christians, other brothers and sisters going, Boy, I don't know why they keep struggling with that. Just let it go. That might be their cross. What is yours? Our life is a daily decision to die to worldliness and live in godliness. It's impossible on our own. That's why Paul cries out, who can rescue me from this body of death? There is no one on earth that can rescue him from the body of death. But thanks be to God, he can be rescued through Jesus Christ our Lord. Church, you must make the daily decision that I will die to sin today. And I will live for Christ. He says, so then I myself, in my mind, am a slave to God's law. But in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. You must.
must decide. You must choose who you deserve. As for me, in my house, we will serve the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, as we come before you, we have been through many struggles this week. We have had many opportunities to exude holiness. I'm sure that we've had many opportunities to fail. Lord, as we continue our walk with you, as we continue our wrestling, Father, help us each and every day through the power of Jesus Christ to shake off the dead body of sin that we want to carry around. And remind us each and every day that we have died to this world and to its desires, that we may live for you. Lord, work in us today and continue transform and refresh and renew. Lord, I thank you that you are not just one and done, that your grace is sufficient. Lord, search our hearts and know us today. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Go, give God thanks. Thank you.